All right, hi everyone. Um, I want to start off a new topic of discussion this week. And we're moving into something which is beyond what we were discussing last week with cases of abortion, uh, where cases of abortion deal with an area of philosophy and applied ethics. And of course, uh, as I introduced the topic, there are political implications and political views about these matters. But in and of itself, applied ethics seems to be one kind of case uh, that has to be taken up within those political views or within an overall outlook upon ethics and morality. Starting this week and then also heading into next week, I want to look at something which has more to do with political philosophy in general. And in asking questions in political philosophy, we're asking about questions of overall justice, of rights, of the kinds of consequences that we might think are entailed in certain kinds of political positions and even public policy decisions, uh, the nature of the good, of welfare, and other associated ideas. And at root, perhaps a question of justice that I have in mind and that uh, we're going to use this guy, Michael Sandel, to help us get at some of these ideas, these theories of justice. One of the root questions is, how should we arrange ourselves socially? What are better and worse, i.e. more just or less just, arrangements of a society? And based on what considerations or values should we ascertain and deliberate about those social arrangements? And so... In today's lesson, I want to discuss one kind of political theory. It's a theory that I think is on, not only me, I think that Michael Sandel believes this. Michael Sandel is a, uh, let me say something about him real fast. Sandel is something of a public intellectual these days. Uh, he is a professor at Harvard University. He has been for roughly 30 years. He's become famous for a particular class he teaches at Harvard. It's an introduction to political philosophy just called Justice. And he teaches this in such a way that he'll teach roughly a thousand students in a large auditorium uh, at a time. And he does this in a very effective way in which he engages various students who are in the auditorium. And so he's become quite popular for doing this. Um, we're going to use some texts from Michael Sandel in order to, to investigate different kinds of political theories. And the first one, what I said a second ago, that I believe is in the ascendancy is a view called libertarianism. And so I want to look at that view to get some core ideas about what libertarianism entails and to use it as a jumping off point to consider the view itself, either its pros or its cons, what might be good about the view, what, what might be objections to the view, and then to look at other implications and also other political theories uh, heading into the future. So in order to do that, I want to give a little bit of a structure to Sandel's piece. The thing is, I think he, he does it pretty well himself. Um, so I'm going to go over some of his chapter a little more quickly than I have in the past texts, because I think some of it's a bit easier to understand, even if it's not always easy, easy to understand the implications of the view. So I'll go through some of the structure. I'll go through some ideas. I want to add a few ideas. And then in your comments and responses, I would also like for you to consider how you might add to the discussion of libertarianism, whether it is in promoting the view or suggesting implications of the view that Sandel or I don't seem to uh, uh, reveal, or if you have other objections to the view that you think are good objections to it as a political theory of justice. Okay, so Sandel starts the chapter by discussing a common problem is a problem of economic inequality. He suggests that in the United States, other countries as well, but in the United States, there are people, we can call them the 1% if we like, who own a majority of the wealth in the nation, who are perhaps billionaires. He references people on the Forbes 400 list. Well, it seems as though there are plenty of other people 
who have no serious aspirations of becoming billionaires, who control much uh, less or fewer uh, standards of wealth than those who are at the top of society. And so a common question that arises here is, given this kind of economic inequality, it's a large gap between the rich and the not so rich, whether we describe the other class as poor or even middle class. Is this arrangement with this gap, is that just? Is that a matter in which we would say this societal arrangement is a just one? And so Sandel suggests, or just as a starting off question, well, there might be reasons to think that it's not just. It might be the case, for example, that the rich have not earned what it is that they enjoy. Maybe they haven't earned their income or their wealth. Maybe they've only earned it off of the backs of others who are working for them, who do not enjoy the privileges that they have as wealthy individuals. And moreover, Sendel raises the issue, well, maybe the poor or middle class people need the wealth or need income or need money much more than people who are at the top of society. And so could there be grounds for reducing economic inequality in order to help people live their lives in such a way that they don't have the economic burdens that they might be facing right now, whether they're poor or middle class or anything other than top of, at the top of society? And so there can be grounds for this. He suggests a kind of utilitarian ground. And we're not going to focus too much on utilitarianism, but it's going to come up occasionally. Here's a brief idea of what utilitarianism amounts to. Utilitarians will say that we should act in such a way that we are trying to promote the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. That's a phrase I, I bet you've heard before, to promote the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. And in doing that, what we would, what we would do in promoting that happiness is to promote the general welfare of all. And so insofar as, for example, we redistributed wealth from people at the top of society to other members of society, it seems as though on a utilitarian ground of promoting the general welfare, the greatest happiness for the greatest number, that this would provide a reason for thinking that people would just be, most people, would be way better off in terms of the prospects of their own lives, if they had more disposable income, as opposed to, say, Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or Donald Trump or others, who might not miss or hardly even notice some of that money being missing. Now, that's a general concern. It's a utilitarian concern. Right away, uh, let me... Tendell talks about two objections. Let me give another kind of objection to this view real fast. And I'm going to do it real fast because I think it's completely superficial. Here's a concern. The superficial consideration that Tendell does not bother with because it is superficial is this. One of the concerns that somebody might have upon hearing the phrase economic inequality is that in virtue of trying to promote or advance economic equality, that somebody might be just suggesting that everybody should just have the same income or the same wealth, exactly the same, across society. And while it's the case that somebody might believe that, that seems like something of a straw man argument. Most people, most people who argue for a redistribution of wealth are unlikely to commit themselves to the idea that everybody should then thereby just make the exact same income or have the exact same amount of wealth. The idea seems to be something different. It's that there shouldn't be a particular kind of gap between the rich and the not so rich such that there is an extreme amount of economic inequality. So in other words, there might be more or less acceptable gaps within income and wealth, but not necessarily all the same. And so that's just to get by a certain kind of issue which I think is a psychological block to even uh, regarding or considering the view 
on hand. The other objections that Sandel considers right away are different than that. One is a utilitarian consideration. The other is a libertarian one. And the libertarian one is what we're going to focus on uh, here. But quickly, utilitarian consideration might be this. Suppose you redistribute wealth. What that's going to do is decrease incentive to work. If you're de decreasing the incentive to work hard or to labor, what that's going to do is decrease productivity. And if you decrease productivity, then there's not going to be as much utility to go around in order to prevent the general, general welfare. In other words, the, the pie shrinks is a way of putting it. And so the utilitarian might offer that as an objection. Now, quickly, that only goes so far. Because the utilitarian, if he's promoting the general welfare in this instance, but also concerned about decreasing incentive and thereby decreasing productivity and overall utility, there should be, in principle, some kind of medium ground in which one would reduce the gap of inequality thereby promoting welfare for everyone, and yet not decrease it in such a way that you are thereby decreasing overall incentive to an extreme standard. And so even here in this utilitarian consideration, there seems to be some kind of middle ground, which frankly would just be an empirical kind of question. Well, how much redistribution is possible in order to promote the general happiness of people, the general welfare? without thereby decreasing disastrously the incentive to work, if that's the standard upon which utilitarians uh, stake their claim. Okay, so that's something about utilitarianism with respect to this. But it's the libertarian who denies that there are any just grounds for redistributing wealth, in other words, changing this economic inequality. And that's what we need to get into here. They want to claim, libertarians, that it is unjust to redistribute wealth. Why? Because it violates a certain kind of right. And it's a right to liberty. We have to investigate what that right to liberty amounts to how it fits within a libertarian view. But briefly, a right to liberty entails the one has the right to do whatever he or she pleases insofar as that does not harm or otherwise infringe upon another person's rights, including his or her right to his or her own liberty. And included in that idea of liberty is a right to one's own property, to one's own person, and to thinking of one's own person as a kind of piece of property in which nobody else can make a stake or a claim uh, upon that person, including one's community or other members in one's society, and thereby, by extension, the government itself. And so, if that's the case, then even if we have these vast economic inequalities between the top 1% in the nation and everyone else, it would be unjust the libertarian claims to redistribute wealth insofar as people have gained their wealth justly and hold it justly. And so I'll emphasize those ideas in a minute. Um, yeah, so I'll start a new video.